David Cameron's resignation honours list. Downing Street says Theresa May won't intervene, despite claims it amounts to cronyism. On leaving number 10, Mr Cameron has nominated political supporters and former staff. Friends say he's rewarding people who've given service. And actually, when you think about it, providing these honours, actually the taxpayer's getting a bargain. I do not believe in honours for politicians who are in office because I think to be in office, to be elected to Parliament, to a council anywhere else, is honour itself. We'll be looking at the names on the list and at the controversy that surrounds the honours system. Also tonight. Britain's biggest rogue trader tells the BBC he thinks city culture still encourages bankers to break the law. The man who tried to behead a passenger at a London tube station last year is jailed for life. We hear from his victim. The family of a dead US Muslim soldier at war with Donald Trump. How you like your burger? We love and the burger with extra protests. Why a row over deporting illegal workers won't go away at an upmarket restaurant chain. In the South, counting the cost, farmers lose millions of pounds to rural crime. And remembering Kezia, a town gathers for the funeral of a six-year-old lost tragedy. Good evening. Downing Street has said Theresa May will not block David Cameron's resignation honours list, stating it would set a very bad precedent if she interfered with his choices, despite the allegations of cronyism. A list leaked to the Sunday Times claimed Mr Cameron had chosen to reward Remain campaigners, donors and number 10 staff, including his wife Samantha's advisor and stylist. Supporters of Mr Cameron have said he was simply recognising people who'd served both him and the nation. Our political correspondent Vicky Young reports. David Cameron's departure from Downing Street was more sudden than he and his staff had hoped. Many who'd been by his side during those six years at the top watched as he made his final speech outside Number 10 after the dramatic loss of the EU referendum. And I want to thank everyone who's given so much support to me personally over these years. And those were more than warm words. Mr Cameron is preparing to thank some of his closest allies through his resignation honours list, and it's proving controversial. It's the royal family who actually hand out the OBEs, MBEs and knighthoods, part of a system designed to recognise people who've made achievements in public life or committed themselves to serving and helping Britain. But on this occasion, David Cameron's accused of rewarding his friends. According to the Sunday Times, the names on the honours list include two donors, Ian Taylor and Andrew Cook, who gave millions to the Conservative Party and the Remain side of the EU campaign. A key member of that losing Remain team, Will Straw, son of former Labour Foreign Secretary Jack Straw. Samantha Cameron's executive assistant, Isabel Spearman, who some claim helped organise her diary and style her hair and four cabinet ministers, including Philip Hammond and Michael Fallon, who all backed Remain. Labour have accused Mr Cameron of cronyism. I'm sure he's got a lot of mates that need rewarding. Um, I want to see an honours system that's fair, that's open, is more democratic and people can nominate to it. I do not believe in honours for politicians who are in office. And British yachtswoman Tracy Edwards, who received an MBE after skippering the first all-female crew around the world, said honours should be for ordinary people. I think they're devalued when they're handed out like this uh, and it's seen as cronyism and you know honours for my mates, uh, which this has definitely been seen as. It devalues it for people like me uh, because I find that I have to then defend it. You know, And someone said to me today, do you want to give yours back? No, I don't. I really like my honour. We're leaving Downing Street for the last time. Mr Cameron's not the first Prime Minister to draw up a resignation honours list. In 1990, Margaret Thatcher gave gongs to a newspaper editor and her press secretary. John Major rewarded several Conservative MPs and staff. Tony Blair didn't have such a list when he left office, but he'd previously been engulfed in a cash-for-honours scandal. The British people have spoken and the answer is 
we're out. Mr Cameron has been criticised by the former UKIP leader Nigel Farage, who was on the winning side in the EU referendum. He said the list contained too many rewards for failure. But others say staff deserve recognition. But these people will have worked, as I say, under intense pressure in number 10, where everything is required yesterday, immediately. You don't take holidays, you don't leave at the end of the day. You know, it's an extraordinary environment and atmosphere. And over the years, over six years in Downing Street, the Prime Minister will build up a huge debt of gratitude. The new Prime Minister, Theresa May, has ruled out blocking Mr Cameron's honours list. Downing Street said it would set a very bad precedent. Let's go to Vicky at Westminster now. And Vicky, these claims will boost those who think that the honours system needs reform. Yes, that's right. And the accusations thrown at the Westminster establishment quite often is that you're all in it for yourselves and this probably won't help very much. Political honours over the years have always caused a stir. Prime Minister's accused of rewarding very wealthy donors or putting their chums into the House of Lords. And there will be some people looking at this list today saying, well, yes, those people in Downing Street might have worked very long hours, but they also earned very high salaries and they're simply being rewarded for doing the job that they were supposed to. But there are MPs MPs too who are worried about undermining the entire system and really devaluing the thousands of rewards which are given out to people all around the country, many of whom work for charities, work very hard for not very much money, simply to make their communities a better place to live. So I think the calls for reform will continue, but there isn't much sign that anything's going to change. Vicky, thank you. Vicky Young there. He was the rogue trader jailed for Britain's biggest ever banking fraud, losing his Swiss bank one and a half billion pounds. Kweku Adubole has now left prison and has given his first interview. Speaking to the BBC, he said he was sorry for his actions, but claimed that crimes like his could happen again, as bankers are under pressure to make profits no matter what. Our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed, has this exclusive report. He became the very public face of the worst excesses of banking, jailed and forever known as the biggest rogue trader in British banking history. And one of the difficult things about coming out of prison is that there's a lot of work to rebuild your life. Today, four years after his conviction, gone the £360,000 a year pay packet, he is dependent on friends for support. I began by asking him what caused that first step on a journey into criminality. We started, you know, trying to spread our wings and make profits because in 2009 we were being asked by our, our senior managers to take more risk. As we got through 2010 and 2011, um, as we were generating more profits, we started to be told to spread our wings even more. So, you know, you'd get emails come through saying, you know, revenue, revenue, revenue. The court heard dramatic evidence of that hunt for revenue, fictitious accounts, secret slush funds. He was called the master fraudster, out of control as bets on the market went wrong and he tried to hide increasing losses. Britain's biggest ever fraud, jail for the rogue city trader who lost more than a billion pounds. Adaboli was sentenced to seven years in prison. Now he is looking for redemption. I have apologised and I will continue apologising. I am devastated, not for myself, but for my institution and the people I worked with. These are not just devices, it's how I feel. I failed, I made mistakes. You were called a liar. In the I time. was called a liar and I accept that I lied. I accept that I was dishonest in the way in which I was doing what I was doing. And looking back now, do you think of yourself as a criminal? Um, I don't think I'm a criminal. It's a label that I have. Um, you made a terrible mistake. You made a, a sequence of terrible choices, but your intentions were always in the right place. I accept that I was found guilty of a crime. This is one Finsbury Avenue in central London, the home of UBS equities trading and where Kweku Adeboli used to work. Since 2012 and his conviction, across the banking sector has culture changed. Yes, there are thousands more compliance officers. Yes, there are thousands more pages of regulation. But at its simplest, banking is a mixture of money, profit and risk. And that can be a toxic combination. Has behaviour changed in banking? Enough? No, absolutely not. 
Um, I think the young people I've spoken to, former colleagues I've spoken to, are still struggling with the same issues, the same conflicts, the same pressures to achieve no matter what. Well, this is a book, um, a sort of a scrapbook that I had in prison, actually. Looking back, Adeboli, older now, maybe wiser, can never work in banking again. It's been a long journey. It would be wonderful if we could turn the page and start the next step. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a long journey. For Kweku Adeboli, a new legal battle. He is fighting deportation back to where he was born, Ghana. He says he has something to offer the UK, giving advice on encouraging traders away from criminal behaviour. Kamal Ahmed, BBC News. A mentally ill man who tried to behead a musician in an attack at a tube station in London has been jailed for life. Muhyiddin Mira, who suffers from paranoid schizophrenia, targeted passers-by at random, saying the attacks were for his Syrian brothers. Our Home Affairs correspondent June Kelly has been speaking to his victim. It was the start of a Saturday night when Muhadeen Mira ran amok with his knife in the tube station. Here he was following musician Lars Zimmerman, who was on his way to a gig laden with instruments and equipment. In the ticket hall, he pounced on him. Lars Zimmerman spoke to the BBC today. He isn't showing his face because he doesn't want what happened to him to define his identity. I remember being... Uh, punched and kicked on the ground and then I lost consciousness probably for five minutes or so and then found myself being looked after expertly by um, a junior doctor. As he lay unconscious, Mira had slashed his throat. He shouted that he was going to spill blood for his Syrian brothers. I feel that he's been suffering from mental health issues for a long time. I'm not at all interested in retribution. Mira was finally brought under control by police using a taser stun gun, prompting this from one onlooker. You ain't no Muslim, bro. This simple response went viral on social media and was reported around the world. You're no Muslim, bro. You ain't no Muslim. I don't feel traumatized by the event. It seems to me that the people who have had significantly tragic outcomes from this incident are mostly Mr. Meyer and his family, and I feel nothing but pity for them. Today, the judge said Mira had been motivated by Muslims being bombed in Syria. He had images relating to so-called Islamic State on his phone. He'll serve a minimum of eight and a half years, and will start his sentence in Broadmoor High Security Hospital. June Kelly, BBC News. Let's take a brief look now at the day's other news stories. Health authorities in America have advised pregnant women not to go to a neighbourhood in Miami where 14 cases of the Zika virus have now been confirmed. An emergency response team from Washington is being sent to Florida to help combat Zika, which has been linked to birth defects in babies. A Russian military helicopter has been shot down in Syria, killing all five people on board. The defence ministry says the crew were returning to their base after delivering humanitarian aid to the city of Aleppo. It's not clear which group brought the helicopter down. The US has carried out airstrikes in Libya, targeting the so-called Islamic State group in the city of Sirte. The Pentagon, Pentagon said the raids were carried out at the request of the country's recently installed unity government. The founder of a flagship free school, which was visited by David Cameron, is facing a jail sentence after being convicted, along with two staff members, of fraudulently obtaining £150,000 in government grants. The court heard that Sajid Hussain Raza, the founder and principal of the King's Science Academy in Bradford, used some of the money to pay mortgages on his rental properties. Our education editor, Branwyn Jeffries, reports. Have gone long for longer days. Standing at the Prime Minister's shoulder, Sajid Raza was a pioneer for David Cameron's free schools. State schools paid for out of taxpayers' money, but groups of individuals could apply to set one up. 
That's what Raza did, but he already had debts, a string of buy-to-let properties, mortgages he struggled to pay. Before the school even opened, he was claiming false expenses and an inflated salary. Far from being a model school, Raza treated the academy like a family business, employing his relatives there and operating with no proper governance. The defendants treated public money like their own and when challenged, fabricated documents to cover their tracks. Senior education officials met Sajid Raza to discuss the free school application. They found him rude and dismissive. He seemed to just pluck figures out of the air. The court heard that if he was challenged, he threatened to call Michael Gove, who was then education secretary. They had serious concerns, but despite that, the application was approved. And within months, the first money was transferred. In October 2012, the Education Funding Agency received allegations from a whistleblower. By January 2013, an audit team was on site investigating. And in January 2014, the principal, Sajid Raza, was arrested. Raza and his sister, Shibana Hussain, denied fraud. But today, they were found guilty by a jury in Leeds. Officials say the allegations were investigated swiftly and argue checks on free schools are robust. But that still leaves unanswered questions. How was a dishonest man allowed to set up a school despite concerns? Brownwyn Jeffries, BBC News. Now, it started with raids by immigration officers on a dozen branches of the upmarket, upmarket burger chain Byron, in which 35 members of staff who'd been working illegally were rounded up. It led tonight to hundreds of people protesting outside a branch of Byron, angry at the company's role in the raids. Last week, the protesters used a different tactic, releasing cockroaches in another branch. Byron has said it was complying with the law. Simon Gompertz has the story. The demonstration outside this Byron in central London, one of its 65 burger restaurants, followed an eruption of anger on social media websites at the raids on foreign staff working illegally in the UK. Living here, uh, having a life here and being settled here and that's suddenly being torn from underneath you, that's quite an upsetting thought. A lot of them send most of their salaries back home so that people there can survive. So imagine it's not only them themselves who are going to suffer, but the people who, who, who are dependent on their, on their wages too. At 9.30 a.m. on the 4th of July, managers called staff meetings at 12 restaurants. Immigration officers appeared. 35 workers from Albania, Brazil, Egypt and Nepal were arrested. One legal Byron worker described the meetings, which staff thought were on cooking burgers properly. We have disguised her identity. Within half an hour, immigration was stood blocking the exit so nobody could leave. They came in, told everybody not to move, pulled everybody up from the kitchen and then started calling out the names of the people they were looking for. They were allowed to go and get a couple of items from home and then put on an aeroplane that night. Deported immediately? Yes. And they were illegal, and so what could they have expected? Yeah, they were illegal and they knew that they were illegal. But the bottom line for me is the fact that what Byron did was wrong. They put them into a chicken pen and let the wolves in. Everybody was crying, including management. It was just a massive shock. Byron wouldn't comment on the allegation that the morning meetings were staged so that immigration officers could catch more people, and it wouldn't give an interview. However, it made a statement that it was the Home Office which led the operation, and Byron wasn't aware that it had those illegal workers. Byron said we carry out rigorous right-to-work checks, but sophisticated counterfeit documentation was used in order to pass these checks. We have cooperated fully and acted upon the Home Office's requests. It's our legal obligation to do so. And if they don't make the right checks, they're subject to a fine of £20,000. And if they decide not to make those checks and employ people illegally, it's a criminal offence. It's an unlimited fine and up to five years in jail. The detail of the law Byron has to contend with didn't placate a group of activists who released cockroaches, locusts and crickets in two of the restaurants on Friday night, forcing them to close. Yet despite the protests, the rules will soon be even tougher and businesses flouting immigration law could be closed down. Simon Gompertz, BBC News. 
It's been another tough day for the Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump, as leading party members distanced themselves from his attacks on the family of a Muslim army captain killed in Iraq. The father of the captain told our North America editor John Sopel that he won't ask for an apology because his dignity is worth more. Trouble for Donald Trump, a GOP nominee in an escalating war of words with the Muslim family of a fallen U.S. soldier. This is one fight that people are telling Donald Trump he can't win, but for the moment he's not listening, complaining again on social media that he'd been the subject of a vicious attack by the Khan family. Their speech at the Democratic convention about the death of their son, an American Muslim posthumously awarded a bronze star and purple heart for heroism, has electrified politics. Today, when I met them, I asked them, had they committed a vicious attack on Mr. Trump? He can insult, he can disrespect women, judges, even the members of his own party. Yet, when an ordinary member, ordinary citizen of this country, a patriotic American Muslim of this country, says anything about him, he says he's been viciously attacked. He has different sets of rights. No, we all have same equal rights. Ghazala Khan was derided by Mr. Trump for not having spoken at the convention. What was her reaction to that? Everyone in the audience have felt that. Without saying a word, I was sitting in their heart. So I was surprised that he doesn't feel the pain. What type of person doesn't feel the pain when you see one? You are attacking Mr. Trump over his behavior very openly. Isn't there a danger that you're going to get attacked openly as well? In every person's life, there comes a time when you choose to either say what is the call of the time or shy away. I felt my family supported my stand. They said, you should do that, and the burden we will equally bear. The normal law of politics is that if you are in a hole, you stop digging. But that's not Donald Trump's style, not only over the Khan family, but this weekend he's got into a right old tangle over policy towards Ukraine. And having previously said he had a close relationship with Vladimir Putin, he's now clarified that he's never actually met him. It's not been a great few days for the Republican candidate. John Sopel, BBC News, Washington. A 12-year-old boy and three other teenagers have appeared in Manchester Crown Court charged with murder. Bradley Moore, who was in his 40s, died in hospital after he was attacked near a McDonald's restaurant in Ashton-under-Lyne last week. The boys can't be named for legal reasons. The UKIP leadership candidate Stephen Wolfe has admitted breaking electoral rules by failing to declare a conviction for drink driving. The MEP, who's the favourite to succeed Nigel Farage as party leader, said he forgot about the conviction when he stood for election as a police and crime commissioner four years ago. He's currently awaiting UKIP's verdict on whether he can run for the leadership, having missed the nomination's deadline by 17 minutes. The daughter of the Labour peer, Lord Janna, has spoken for the first time about the claims of child sexual abuse made against her late father. Marion Janna told BBC Newsnight she feels it's an outrage that her father is part of the independent inquiry chaired by Justice Goddard. Tom Simons has more. Last year, Lord Janna was chased into a criminal court to face allegations he was a child abuser. He was dying of dementia. His daughter, Marion, was by his side in the car. The paparazzi were banging really violently on the window. I thought the windows of the car were going to be smashed and Dad was terrified. There was no trial because he died. The allegations date back to Lord Janna's decades as a Leicester MP. More than 30 men and women claim he befriended them as children, sometimes in care homes, and abused them. But Marion Janna and her family have no doubts he's innocent. Because we have the evidence about how he couldn't have done it. We, we know. So it's not a sort of blind loyalty because he was a wonderful dad. Questioned in 1992, he denied a relationship he had with a teenager from a children's home was sexual. Very pleased to help all I can. His family say they will show that all his accusers are making it up. Next year, the new National Child Abuse Inquiry will examine the claims. Not a court, but it will reach conclusions about facts. And Lord Janus' children are furious it is even focusing on their father. 
It's an absolute outrage. The other 12 strands are all institutions, big institutions, the NHS, the church, and there's one strand on one individual who was never convicted and at the time had of this round of accusations had severe dementia so couldn't defend himself and is now dead. She says there's no chance of justice. His accusers say they've been denied it. All my clients are interested in justice and the right to be heard and the truth coming out. But the Jana family have refused to take part in this inquiry. They hope instead to fight for their father's reputation in the civil courts. Tom Simons, BBC News. Germany has said that Europe will not be blackmailed by Turkey into allowing its people visa-free travel to the EU after Ankara suggested it could back out of the deal to stem the flow of migrants into Europe. Tensions between Germany and Turkey are increasingly strained after the failed Turkish coup. Yesterday, a German court banned President Erdogan from addressing a rally of supporters in Cologne via video link. Well, let's join our correspondent Jonathan Head, who's in Istanbul tonight. Jonathan. Well, that migrant deal, you know, has always been problematic. Uh, nobody really quite knew how it was going to work. There have long been disagreements over the conditions for Turks to get that visa-free travel. What's changed, though, here since that coup last month is the mood. Turkey feels it should have got more wholehearted support from the EU and indeed from its ally, the United States, and less criticism. And that's what's causing mistrust here and resentment. The impact of the coup is still being felt in so many ways. Here in Cologne over the weekend, supporters of Turkey's president were hoping to hear him speak via satellite link. But wary of clashes, a German court blocked it. The Turkish government has reacted with fury. How come German officials, who always talk about freedom of expression, prevented our president from joining a legal and peaceful rally? And this was the Turkish capital, Ankara, today. These people had come to protest against alleged American interference in the coup. Their target, a top US general, here trying to smooth unsettled diplomatic waters. The coup was crushed within 24 hours, and most of the perpetrators have now been detained. But it could have had a very different ending. So don't be fooled by appearances. The confidence of this country in itself has been profoundly shaken, and that's bound to strain already prickly relations with Western countries who the government here feels have not been as sympathetic as they should be. So what about the controversial deal struck with the EU in March to keep hundreds of thousands of migrants in Turkey? That deal offered substantial financial aid in return for Turkey accepting asylum seekers sent back from the EU. But Europe has to accept equal numbers of genuine Syrian refugees from Turkey. And Turkey wants visa-free travel to the EU for its citizens. Without that, it says, it will pull out of the deal by October. Is that threat serious? These are exceptional times in Turkey, says this academic, and its international partners need to be more sympathetic. One has to realize that this country has just left behind a very serious coup attempt in which for the first time, I mean, the Turkish military was divided and arms were used uh, against the Turkish parliament, against politicians. So I think it would be important to understand the sensitivities. Proud, nationalistic, and sharing a troubled history with Europe, diplomatic relations with Turkey have always been hard to manage, never more so than now. Jonathan Head, BBC News, Istanbul. Now, with just days to go until the opening of the Rio Games, a member of the International Olympic Committee has told the BBC that there needs to be a complete overhaul of anti-doping systems to avoid any repeat of the Russian doping scandal. This afternoon, Russia's sports ministry said it hoped to know by tomorrow how many of its athletes will be cleared to compete. Our sports editor, Dan Rowan, has the latest from Rio. Four days and counting. Final preparations continue here as Rio gets ready for the start of the Games. But as the fallout from the Russian doping scandal continues to mar the build-up, one member of the International Olympic Committee today told me that such a crisis must never happen again. I think there has to be yeah, a complete overhaul of the system. I would love to see an, a completely independent 
body that really takes care of anti-doping in the world right now. Uh, I think there's too many conflicts of interest that we have within the different bodies in the world, which is hard to avoid when everyone's intertwined in international sport. But this is, at the moment, the number one pressing issue for the future of the Olympic movement, I think. Russia's women's archers are already world champions. Now they're aiming for Olympic gold. They've been cleared to compete by their international federation, but must wait for final confirmation from an IOC panel that's been set up to review each athlete's drug testing record. The Russian government says they expect to be told tomorrow which of their team has been cleared. We know that, but uh, sorry, I don't care about this. I think the archer is a clean sport, and there's uh, no difficulty because uh, during the this year, and the four times take the uh, doping test. One of the sports most affected by all this is rowing, due to take place here in this spectacular venue. 22 members of the Russian team have been banned because they failed new eligibility criteria. In effect, they were deemed to have not been tested enough outside of their own country. That's five crews reduced to just one. Once again, Team GB hoped to be the dominant nation in this sport, but does Russia's depleted squad take anything away from the competition? The most important thing is the credibility and ethics of, of Olympic sport by a long, long way. So I, I think that in this, you know, we're, that's being tackled, and that's what's really important. And if there are one or two boats that are, that are not, not in, in rowing, well, that's minor compared to the message that uh, the public needs to, to, to be confident of. But the Games face other challenges too. A 16-month study has found that waste levels in the city's waters remain dangerously high. And pollution isn't the only worry at the sailing venue, where the main ramp for boats to access the water has partially collapsed, raising concerns about the quality of construction. For organisers of Rio 2016, the sooner the actual sport begins, the better. Dan Rowan, BBC News, Rio. Now, news night's about to begin over on BBC Two in a few moments. Here's Evan. Now, rebel Labour MPs have been trying to find out what happens if Jeremy Corbyn remains leader and they, en masse, unilaterally dump him and declare independence. We'll let you know whether they think that's an option. Join me now on BBC Two. Well, that's all from us. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Good night. <laughs>